Welcome for the second session of the Science and Spirituality series. We will start from where we have left last time about the memory. So I will give you a brief introduction about the basis of memory and from there sure. we will take the discussion forward. Yes, now, uh, science still do not understand where exactly the thought and experience is formed. So nobody knows why the thought is generated. Probably one theory says within the brain, the other one is in the mind. But one thing is very clear, thought and the experience have influence on the brain and the brain structure, which we have discussed last time. The moment, the moment thought forms, for example, there is a visual impression and the thought is generated. First impression goes to the memory that is in the temporal lobe to pick up, to create what is the thought and the experiences. And then a signal will go to the frontal lobe uh, for the further control and awareness of the thought. And simultaneously, this will give information to this area to motivate uh, the further action about the thought. This is called simulate gyrus. And one section of the impression goes to the motor cortex for the motor actions, what need to be done. Where is and the motor cortex? Simultaneously, mm -hmm. there is a deeper part inside, and this is called the motor cortex is here, sir. Okay. Motor cortex is here. That will take the necess necessary action based on the thought. And then this spot is the insula. And this is the one which coordinates the cortical action, thought, experience with the limbic system, which is down here. And this limbic system, which in turn creates with the chemical brain, which secretes the appropriate chemical response. Now, whenever uh, there is a thought and the experience is generated, every thought and experience generates a new synapse inside the brain. And that synapse is very specific for that experience. Whenever you have a similar ex uh, thought and experience in future, same synaptic system will get activated. That's how the brain works. Now, last time we also talked about when two people are talking, the mind will come uh, oh, oh, one second, doctor. When you say synapse, um, can yes, we sir. equate it to an electrical circuit or something? Yes, no. sir. Electrical circuit where the chemical is released and it talks okay. to the other uh, neuron yeah. what yeah. action to be taken forward. Oh, okay. Now, when two uh, people are talking, there is an, a, what is called as minds joined together. It's called quantum entanglement. Okay. Now, when the entanglement is strong and yes. then you get a full, full focus on what the discussion is going on, Okay. That is what we call one side of the spectrum is the okay. mindfulness. Okay. And when it becomes loose and you are partly listening, but you are not completely focusing. Now, when it goes to the other end, it becomes absent mindlessness, but you are there, but you are not really paying attention to what is going on. So this right. is the range of things that happen. Once this happens, these signals will go forward into a memory process. So as soon as the, uh, the thought goes inside, you develop a, what is called as immediate memory, which is very, very transitory. And then from the immediate memory, whatever is given attention will go to your short term memory, which is an electrical signal, which goes to the hippocampus and stays there. And when we are in a deep sleep, whatever is very important, if there are mindfulness is there, those electrical signals will get converted into chemical form into your files. They are called long term memory what is called as a uh, something like a JPEG files, which will get covered into the files and get stacked in it. And in that, nobody knows how much is stored here. Present understanding is that what is important for the day-to-day -day living is kept in the hippocampus and remaining files probably kept in the storage outside the brain, something similar to cloud storage. The only difference with the, that memory and this memory for the cloud storage usage, you pay for it. For your own memory, if you don't use it, you pay for it. That's the difference. So with this, that is, if there is a significant event that takes place, and that can create a severe impact, it can create a, a genetic manipulation. And that part of the memory gets stuck to the uh, genetic uh, DNA, which can be carried on for next seven generations, and then it fades away. So this is the four types of memories what we modern science can understand today. With this, uh, with this cloud memory, 
Now we are not sure completely the memory is stored inside the brain because the capacity is not possible. However, when a person is in deep sleep, all the files which are not necessary, like immediate memory fades away, short term memory also goes into the trash and only the long term memory gets reorganized and then gets stored permanently. Now, uh, I would like to ask in this relation to one question to uh, uh, Sriyam. Uh, uh, I was operating one day on a very complex uh, brain surgery. Uh, there was a very unanticipated problem which I never could think of that will happen. And it happened. And the whole thing became a very uh, dangerous situation where if I don't take some decision quickly, uh, it is going to be fatal to the patient. Now, fortunately, I got one idea immediately and the problem was solved and we got away with the complication and patient did very well. After the surgery, I was just thinking, think, sitting and replaying the whole surgery events. Then I realized that solution for that complication, I have never read, nor I never heard from anybody. So then I went back and checked in the internet. No one has ever described it as that. So I later on wrote a technical note. So I wanted to understand who gave me this thought at that moment of crucial situation, which is crucial to me as well as to the patient. Um, it takes time to absorb everything that you said, but uh, let me put it this way. Let's look at memory. Yes, sir. My first question is, is there a physical organism in the brain which can be similar to a memory chip? Yes, sir. These, these chemical files, more or less like a, a, a JPEG files, there are a lot of information is zipped into the uh, files and stacked. And okay. that's how even language is also stored in the same fashion today. All right. All right. And so, what, the question we don't understand is the yeah. amount of memory we take every day is right. so much and it is impossible for this to hold inside this brain. That is why people think that there is two processes, one, a memory which is kept inside the hippocampus and there is memory which is distributed locally related to uh, touch, vision, everything in the corresponding areas of the brain as well as in the cloud probably. That is called okay. universal memory. No, I, I have, we, let's look at it this way. I don't want to draw a conclusion right now. Yes, sir. So, um, I mean, that is the uh, mode of... Uh, uh, discussion in a dialogue, in a yes. samvad, or in a uh, as defined by the Tarka Shastra, you don't form conclusions. We'll go slowly. Look at yes. this. And, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So um, now, memory, as far as we know at the moment, can be stored only in the brain. Yes. You're, you're saying that there is so much that we don't know how it can store everything. You said that. Um, maybe there are the function of an active brain is to be able to keep it in some other form of codes when not required and strike it when it is required. Yes. Sir. It may not be in the form of the ordinary short term memory and so on. Now the problem what I'm looking at is that since the neurons the brain cells are not only in the brain, but also in some way, some of in the gut. Yes, sir. Even I think in the heart, there are neurons and maybe in the lungs. We don't know. Maybe you know, I don't know. So I feel and then in the spinal cord is also neurons. Yes, sir. So I'm saying there are multiple uh, locations, we are looking at it, I'm not saying, uh, where the neurons are there. Although the concentration of the um, neuron, the cells, brain cells is in the brain structure. Yes, sir. But there are other parts. For instance, it, some, it has been noticed that a person whose heart was uh, transplanted as somehow acquired the characteristics of a person uh, whose heart was transplanted into him. Now, normally, the heart doesn't have a brain. I mean, the, if, you trans, if you transpose a brain, I mean, if, what is it called? 
transplantation now if you transplant a brain into another person and then his character changes we can understand but if the heart where you don't see any much of a notable brain structure right but there are certainly neurons when that is if a person's character is changing so what i'm trying to say is while the brain may be the most important part of this whole structure of thought it is kind of distributed in the other parts of the human system dispersed in its own way so there may be other parts of the body where the neurons are storing memories i'm what i'm trying to say this is to be research we can't show sure, sir yes we do not know at the moment yeah yeah all i'm saying is perhaps there are uh, other neurons like in the gut and the brain and, and the heart and the lungs and muscles even maybe because any have the nerve fibers go there so where uh, some of these things which we call memories are already are stored okay yes, now the question of whether there is an outside memory other than the actual physical structure although now you expand your horizon and say it's not only here it could be stored in any organ in some way may not be as good as functional as in the brain but now we have to go to see if there is something some element of consciousness which is outside the brain yes it could be in the memory uh, memory or even beyond that so now uh, mind now, mind mind i mean mind, mind. Uh, so mind now but when we say mind normally we are talking about the brain only generally yes we have no other location where we can find out the mind now here we are first stepping out from that boundary and saying yes there are other parts of the body all physically first uh, also which can be mind like the gut which has neurons yes heart which has neurons lungs little little brains are there and therefore little little minds are functioning and it is the 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 uh, collective response of all these neurons not only the brain that brings about what we call the mind in the body uh, one second now here now you said about memory the memory is when you have an experience and you store that memory yes sir it goes in and then it store it's like put in a cubby hole or something like that electronically let's say electric charge or whatever chip and you can draw it out whenever you want now if you look at it carefully If you read the Ishavash Upanishad, there is a beautiful statement which says that he who worships ignorance enters into darkness, and he who worships knowledge enters into greater darkness. And this is a <laughs> very funny statement. Yes. <laughs> Normally, one would say, "Oh, I can understand one who worships ignorance enters into darkness." no but they prime not in darkness because i am not in ignorance i know i have knowledge then the upanishad turns around in the next shloka and says but one who worships knowledge enters into greater darkness now yes is this just a juggling of words or are they trying to say something so while we understand that there should let's let's propose first that there is a physical um collective memory first which is not only here but also in other parts of the other body parts. mainly like gut and so on right. and also the heart probably has neurons we don't know because otherwise characteristics don't pass to somebody mm-hmm. and and so on now the question is knowledge we are saying knowledge is also darkness which means it's not totally free of ignorance that's what it is now let's look at the mechanism called knowledge yes, this is the mechanism of knowledge uh, i have in front of me a nice little uh, microphone which is called the blue you may not be able to see yeah you can see it yes, shape it's like shape like a shivling here yes yes, yes. so <clears throat> there is it now if, when i first saw it i didn't know anything about this Right, doctor. Now I have seen it. Yes, sir. And I have seen its shape, its form, 
its function has been explained by Radha. I know so therefore that it is a very sensitive microphone. So this happened many two, three days back when I first saw it. Before that, I didn't know anything about this. Well, I know that there is something called a microphone which which uh, um, increases your voice, increases your volume. That I know, but I didn't know of this. Now I know it, meaning that whatever images and experience I have about this object has been stored in my memory somewhere. Yes. We don't know which part, but it is stored. So when I say I have knowledge of this microphone, it means that I have stored in my memory this knowledge, what I have learned about this microphone. And when I say no about it, it means I'm able to pick it out whenever I want at any given time. If that's not possible, then next minute I won't know if it's a microphone. So any time, given time, I'm able to go back into that chip and retrieve that memory. This is my understanding of the sentence. I have knowledge of the microphone. Yes. Now I'm saying, so all the entire process of knowledge is like that. I'm not talking about the brain mechanism. Let's not, uh, many people may not even know. I also don't know much about the brain. But um, the mechanism of knowledge is, first you don't know. Yes. Then you know. And the point when you know is, that is not knowledge, it's understanding. Understanding. Once it is understood, it is stored, then it becomes knowledge. So yes. any knowledge that we have from nuclear physics to Vedanta to Upanishad to ordinary things, including the study of the brain, yes, is a memory. Well, I mean, practically it's a memory. You need to draw it. You are able to draw it at any time. So we call it, we say we are intelligent because we can draw it at any time, this knowledge. So if it is, if all knowledge that we know of is a memory, we are asking the question, if we are seeking for the essence of truth, according to Upanishad, let's say. Now the truth, now look at this. All memory can only be in the past. You cannot have a memory present. Correct. When you say memory, it automatically says past. Past. Now, if the Upanishad, the seer, is seeking the truth, the absolute truth, that truth has to be now, present. It cannot be in the past. Past. If, if it is in the past, it's a memory and it's, it cannot be. Therefore, that truth cannot be trapped, caught or defined by any previous knowledge that we know. So, at that point where the understanding takes, where there is no memory, if it is possible, that point, not in deep sleep. Look at deep sleep. In, 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 uh, I don't know the exact function of the brain during deep sleep, but when I see it in a rational way, what happens is there is no outer cognition of any kind. There seems to be also no inner cognition of any kind, except when you are dreaming. Yes, sir. In the uh, uh, dream, you know, in, separate states. Separate. So, REM. Yes, REM. Rapid eye movements. So, suppose I am in that somnambulistic uh, part of total deep sleep. Yes. Um, we don't know anything about that state generally. Right. What neurologists and neurosurgeons and people who are experimenting in that field like you can do it, probably explore what happens at that point. Because when we wake up, we generally feel that we had a blissful sleep. Correct. Unless it's a bad sleep, of course. So even though at that time we are not aware of it, there is some witness out there. At that point, what is working? I'm just laying down what you can do in your scientific way. Yes, yes. I'm coming from the other side, from metaphysics. Yes, sir. Is there something we can find out what happens in that deep sleep when there are no dreams? Yes. I am trying to say that in that point, when there is no memory, there is no nothing happening, everything is still, where the ordinary things which we call knowledge do not exist. 
don't, at least we don't see it existing. But there is still consciousness. Yes. There is something there. I'm thinking it is from that something that wisdom comes. Now I'm trying to separate the word wisdom from knowledge. Yes. And it may not be based on any memory whatsoever. So in, in that case where you were in an emergency, where you tried all your thoughts and knowledge, which from the, dark, from the darkness did not work, something took over, which is other than the ordinary understanding of the brain that we have. Now, that root may be that which exists when no knowledge, no memory, because knowledge is memory, nothing exists except the essence. And therefore, if an idea from that can come in like an original idea, even without your knowing about it, that means that particular part of consciousness may be a repository of infinite knowledge, much more than the cells can hold in the brain. Yes. Yes. I'm just putting out a... Absolutely, guys. Because I was, I was blank, absolutely blank at that moment. So, <laughs> it is in the blankness that these things happen. This is, uh, well, uh, the Buddhists call it Shunya. Blank. Right? So, now that blankness, I think, is the origin of consciousness which manifests itself in our brains because it is a complex organism. I think it, the, the human brain is the best uh, organ that we have, even compared to other animals. So, but therefore, can we think about it this way, that consciousness is not just the property of the brain, although Normally, what we call mind and consciousness is a function of the brain. But maybe there is something beyond that, which yes. is, cannot be touched by our ordinary modes of knowledge and memory. Not even memory, knowledge. Knowledge is yes. memory. Okay. The yogis have worked out um, a method of trying to touch it. One is the state called Turiya, which is the repository of all wisdom. The Upanishad says, you know that and you don't need to know anything else. That's partly also because yes. uh, all your desires are satisfied. That's one side of the story. It may be also that you don't need to depend on memory cultivated knowledge after that. It is the elder brother or mother of what we call intuition in a little ways. And the Upanishad also says that that is our true essence. What I'm trying to arrive at, it's not a conclusion, a theory at the moment, is that if that is touched, which is beyond memory, beyond our ordinary understanding, yes. Yes. that because, yeah, when that is touched, then perhaps even the brain begins to function better. Absolutely. Because yes. it is the source. Yes. Of, of thought. So, in the practical sense, the yogis have devised a couple of things. One of them, very simple thing is, um, that what we call thought, I'm not talking from the brain point of view, what we call thought is actually little, I don't know how you look at it. I'm saying from my side is not a continuous chain. Yes, sir. One, thought, one thought comes, it flashes and it goes and another comes. Yes. yes. So when they are together, then it looks like a continuous thing, but actually there is no continuity. Why? Because there is an infinitesimal little gap between each thought, which is so small that we don't see it. Therefore, it's like one chain. Like the old movie films, where one action has many frames, when you roll it at a particular speed, you see it as a continuous action. Yes, 24 frames per second, yes. Yeah, exactly. So this is how the thought works, the chain of thought. Yes. The yogis are saying that therefore, if they are individual frames attached together into a chain, 
Gita puts it nicely calling it the beads on a string in the Sutra. Okay. Um, if that is so, however small, there must be a gap between them. However small. Maybe so small that ordinary time cannot reckon it, maybe. But yes. So, if there is a gap, then according to our theory, our understanding, it is from the gap that the frames come. Not that the frames form the gap. Right. And if you somehow touch that gap, you have touched the whole frame, infinite frame. Okay. And now the question is, with your capacities and your knowledge and your scientific understanding and with the improved gadgets that you get today in science, instruments that you have in science, is it possible, I'm asking this question, yes, to, yes. To, to look at the brain in these different stages of... Uh, then perhaps we could arrive at the essence of what is called the mind, which functions through the brain. Yes, sir. It is uh, possible, sir. Today's uh, knowledge, I would like to show you something very interesting. Every experience what we have in day to day will form a special form of neuron here. This is the okay. MRI image of how the brain looks today. Okay. So these what? are the fibers. In what, sta in what stage? This is in a conscious stage. Okay. So this is how we gather information. And we develop the dendrite, the network like a tree and the synapses which form the whole day in 24, whatever number of hours we are awake. And this is how it looks really frightening for me now to get into this organ and operate. It looks so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens in the deep sleep is mm -hmm. brain, brain will never sleep. It's mm -hmm. be very, very active, though we are resting very well. Now, right. over, number one, all the unwanted elements and synapses in this it will take off so that right. you have the capacity for the next day number, right. two, number two it, it has spent a lot of chemicals and proteins called neuropeptides and neurotransmitters it will resynthesize again to be ready for the alertness and the activity tomorrow otherwise okay. you will you will not be alert or in the next day so right. the third thing it does is it consolidates all the memory of the days, what is required and what is record, not required, and eliminates that. And when the elimination process, some of them are thrown into the REM sleep. That is why some of these things are seen in the dreams. Mm. And when they get jumbled up, you also get meaningless, meaningless right. dreams. Right. Yes. And, and lastly, it also restructures the entire structure of the brain and also they uh, give instructions to the body how rest of the uh, body should function depending upon the experience. Now, one second, doctor. So, therefore, all this is done not with our conscious understanding. No. No. So, no. no. So, it is not as if we are asking the brain to eliminate nothing. No. No. It's, it's, it's doing it on its own. On its own. So, the, so the <laughs> my <laughs> major question, who is doing it? Who is yes. doing it? Yeah. Where, so, right. When, you're, uh, when yes. you're awake, yes, I am asking the brain to do it. So therefore, the brain is functioning when I'm sleeping, when I'm not thinking of any other activity till tomorrow. Then who is it that yes. is, what is it? Uh, do who or what, whatever you. We really do not understand. I what know. we know today is that mm -hmm. Whenever we give too much of importance to some particular aspect of anything what we have seen in the daytime and give a lot of attention, that, mm. gets, that gets stored as a long-term memory. Ah. And, and what you use more frequently, that will mm. get also stored as long-term memory. That is how the concept of rehearsal has come. You rehearse mm. it well, it will mm. be st stored, stored very well. Remaining ones <laughs> will get away. And but then for... Mm. This is the culprit, what we call as the insula, is the one which decides, probably to certain extent. Mm. This is this is a link between the neocortex, that is the most advanced brain, and the limbic brain. It is in between. It is the atman of the brain. To some extent. It's deep mm. inside. And mm. th this is how it looks right deep inside. You will not see it. So ah. This is the part. Right. Is let's the, see, let's see. One minute, sir, doctor. Yes, Hold yes, on. Sir.
This is the part deep, deep inside. This is the insula. Okay, okay. Insula. Uh, let uh, two minutes. I'll explain, sir. Insula is one which responds to all your internal uh, desires, right. internal requirements, starting from the hunger, uh, thirst, uh, se sexual urge, and all reactions. What used to happen? Everything for the internal requirements. But at the same time, it also responds to the external demands. So the moment that is an experience, uh, the two things will happen. The insula will take it on and pass it on to the limbic system for an acute reaction. And cortex either can facilitate that or it can block it. That capacity is there in the okay. frontal cortex. Whereas okay. insula, it just instinct instinctly react. For example, uh, you for a child, if you the, show, show a chocolate, you'll get excited. So that excitement and happiness comes from the insula for the body. Same way, somebody can say during the exam, I'm having butterflies in the stomach. So that twisting of internal organs can happen in the same way. And third expression is that I can't see him eye to eye. The moment you see that reaction, you, are, you don't have to speak, the reaction will trigger. You will start getting anger, BP will go, heart rate will go. And pulse, BP, uh, heart rate, respiration, uh, intestinal movements, uh, diarrhea, all these things are caused by the insula. So, and this is the part, and that creates that kind of an emotional reaction. And this emotional reaction can only be controlled by the frontal lobe, where it can hold on by the top-down regulation, or it can allow it to happen. Depending on that, two things will happen. A chemical reaction, the substance which will further amplify the reaction, Similarly, a motor reaction, whether you react physically, you know, you can either attack or fight or flight or whatever happens. Now, uh, the reaction is so quick on the insula that nobody can control it. It is spontaneous, except now there is enough evidence to say that the only thing that controls the insula is the meditation. When you do good meditation, there is evidence, there is an activity increases in the frontal lobe. Is there a... Cortex type is there actual proof through pictures or through scan that when you yes, are sir. meditating consciously, there is more activity in the frontal lobe? Yes. Frontal sir. lobe? Yes. Mm -hmm. This frontal lobe mm -hmm. and especially the medial aspect of the frontal lobe. Mm -hmm. Similarly, there is something called corpus callosum, which is uh, in between here. This is the bridge yeah. between the mm -hmm. right and the left brain. Right. This right. increases and mm -hmm. there are many uh, uh, the insula comes under control. So that's okay. the mechanism probably meditation can take you to calm state. At the same time, it secretes opioids while you are at a calm state to take, uh, 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 there is a gap in the uh, reaction time. That Marx said that religion is the opiate of the masses. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's why you go into a pleasant state. Yesterday you were telling about the music. Music yeah. also music also releases opioids. So okay. that's where ah, you go into ah, the tra tranquil ah, state. Yes, and yes. That is that is evidence now. Uh, a, a substance called Narcan, which mm -hmm. block, blocks the action of the opioids. If you uh -huh. give Narcan before that, you don't enjoy the music at all. Oh, so oh, so oh. that shows a clear evidence that it creates a flow state of consciousness once there is opiates. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we would like to know now how to make use of the memory without getting used by the memory using the mm -hmm. meditation. So, yes, so that's the thing. So first of all, we can, what is how much time we have? 20 minutes. Okay. So, <laughs> let's go into this carefully. Do we, because then we can project it tomorrow in the next session. And okay. Is there a, some kind of a division between the left and the right brain? Yes, sir. And does the left and the right brain take care of, although in general they are taking care of all activities, are there some special activities which are, for instance, since you are talking about music, I'm connecting from there. Yes, sir. Is there one part, left or the right part of the brain, which is more involved when there's music, for instance? Is yes, there? Sir. Yes, sir. So, 
uh, especially music is the best example to explain that. Uh, mm -hmm. left, brain, left brain has the uh, language functions. Mm -hmm. So the lyric, the pronunciation, mm -hmm. and, the, and the meaning of the lyric, mm -hmm. based on the pronunciation, comes from the left brain. Okay. The right brain talks about the diction and the emotion to the song. Okay. Okay. And then the, the both sides will balance to the rhythm. If you want to follow the rhythm, the both brains work, work together. Whereas that emotion, feel, scale, shruti is from the right brain. The Intu intuitive, intuitive, more intuitive. intuitive. More intuitive. Whereas more creative. Mm -hmm. More creative, more emotional. Left is logical, intellectual. Intellect, mathematical. Intellectual, math mathematical. So this mm -hmm. gives uh, the exact pronunciation, syntax, mm -hmm. words, words, lyric is from the left brain. So mm -hmm. left brain is damaged, they will mm -hmm. make a lot, lot of mistakes on the lyric. Whereas mm -hmm. right brain is damaged, they will read it like a prose. They Jill Bolt. Jill, Jill, Jill Bolt. Jill Bolt, exactly. Okay. Mm. So okay. This okay. is the basic difference, but they work so synchronously. Together. 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 Yes. Yes. Okay. So now, what, since you said, is there a way of doing it, of understanding this from a yogic uh, point of view? Yes. First, let me uh, explain this. The yogis believe, by that, through their experience, of course, understand, not believe, understand, that they also understand that there is a left and the right brain. They may not call it brain, but that there is a left and the right side of your personality, of right. your psyche, right. psyche, not personal. And that left and right is intimately linked to your breath. Mm. According to the science of pranayama, Science of Pranayama is, um, is not the practical levels of Pranayama, the theory of Pranayama. Um, for no human being does the left and the right nostril work together at the same rate all times, at all times. According to the science of Pranayama, every 33 and a half minutes, this is a very rough estimate, 33 and a half minutes, the left shifts to the right and the right shifts to the left. The breath. The breath. Right. Um, which doesn't mean that the right, when the left is operating, the right is not operating. That's not what it means. It means that there is more movement on the right, right. than the left or more movement on the left than on the right. right. Um, Every 33 and a half minutes when it shifts from left to right, which means there is more movement on the left than the right or vice versa. Mm. When it happens, for a few minutes that time, the only then it is equal. Both are equal. Yeah. Now, according to the yogi, when it is equal, then the central channel called the Shushumna starts working better. It's always working, but it starts working better. Right. Now, Shushumna are, is connected to the spine right. and its connection to the brain. While these left and the right side nadis are called, they are connected more to the vagus nerve and the parasympathetic nervous system, the left and the right breath, while the central one is the Shushumna, when both have to be equal. And according to the yogi, it's only when the Shushumna functions fully. And the yogi can make it function at all times. That one is able to ascend one's awareness and consciousness beyond the ordinary. And perhaps go beyond the ordinary brain, which is a functional instrument we have. Okay. Now the left and right. The thing is, According to Pranayam, according to the Nadi distribution in yogic anatomy and physiology, which may not uh, be the same as, I don't know, uh, the left breath is connected to the right brain. 
and the right breath is connected to the left brain. Because they say that the nadis cross here. At the, this is called ajna because that is a meeting point where these two cross. Yes, sir. So the right breath is connected to the left brain. This can, this should be experimental. I'm saying that it should be made part of an experiment. And the left breath is part of the right brain. Okay. Now you said that the right brain is the intuitive. Yes. Mostly. Yeah. So therefore, if the right brain is the more intuitive, then when the left breath or the left nadi is functioning better, then it has a better chance of being more intuitive. We did. And if the right is working, then it attaches to the left brain, which is more calculative, more arithmetical. Arithmetical. Right. right. So, so, when both are equal, then you have gone into the beyond right intuition, beyond practical, you have gone beyond anything that can be defined, which is the Sushumna Nadi's functioning. So therefore, the yogi starts by balancing them, balancing the ida and the pingala, pingala, the left and the right breath. So now that balancing is called anulom vilom. So when the mind moves with the breath, yes. if it's moving more with the left breath, then your intuitive system is working perfectly. It's only, it is not through the arithmetical brain that you can go beyond ordinary thought. You can go only with the intuitionary right side brain. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Now, for instance, the yogi has, through training, he has mastered the technique by which he can actually shut off the left. He can shut off the left brain, which is so mathematical and calculative. Not like when uh, poor Jim had a hemorrhage. We don't have to make a hemorrhage for this to happen. By constantly um, shutting off the right breath, we can, after some time, shut off much of the activity of the left brain. So all calculations, all mathematical dimensions, everything cease. Then, when you give attention to the left, and the idanadi is working properly, then what happens is, then the right brain, which is the intuitive brain, it skips all spatial calculations. Right. So then, with that working, the yogi sees the tree, the plant, the bird, everything not different from him because he is not spatially separated from them. He sees it as one. Right. So now, my discussing this with you is basically I have a not a vested interest, but <laughs> since you're a well-known neurologist and you have this um, neurosurgeon and you have facilities for this, is it possible to measure the left and the right brain's movements? And, and, and it's uh, scanning them while we are involved in the practice of this pranayam, so that to see if actually this works. Yes. And is it possible that in kumbhak, in mild kumbhak, is it possible that something else is happening in the brain? Because then the Sushumna Nadi is acting. What is going on? What are the colors that you can see in the scan? It would be a wonderful thing to go into this. Yes. As far as the physical body is concerned, we are very well aware now, right? Right brain controls the left half of the body and the left, the right half. And the language is always is in the left brain in the majority of the people. Even in, that's how the handedness comes. Now we call the left brain as a, a dominance. So that's why most of the people are right-handed individuals. But as far as the mind is concerned, it's very difficult to study at the moment. Sir. But I think future certainly we'll be able to uh, study. Brain. I'm talking about the brain. Can we study brain. the brain activity while we alter the breath? 
आई एम रेडी टू बी ए जेडी पिक नो प्रॉब्लम कैन बी सी वॉट काइंड ऑफ वेव्स आर हैपनिंग एट दैट टाइम इन द राइट ब्रेन बिकॉज देन नाउ इट इज पीपल वॉन्ट यू नो साइंस फिजिकल सो इफ यू कैन शो दैट Yes. Then they will get interested in understanding the deeper aspects. Yes, sure, sir. I'm, I'm open to it. it. I'm not saying that the experiment will succeed. As I say, I'm not saying that because yes. if I say that, then it's preconceived. I don't yes. want anything preconceived. Yes. Can we find out? When, sure. When, when you start an enquiry, you cannot have a pre. We can't have a preconceived idea, right? It's possible. I think when we started discussing this is in the last talk. I, one of the things you said struck me, which is, as far as science is there, that also nowadays a certain uh, section of science also has a prejudice. Yes. That anything beyond actual physical things do not exist or can't be. Yes. I would say that is as much a prejudice as the religious and spiritual people saying that this has nothing to do with science. Absolutely. That's also a prejudice. Yes. we need to strike the common ground between these two yes right for that persons like you who are into the subject of science who also have the uh, <laughs> humility to understand that there might be something more to this than what we know because as i see it all inquiry and discovery starts when somebody says i don't know let me look yes so exactly. yeah so since we are discussing is there a way to touch that which is beyond ordinary thinking i would say it's a good idea to start with experimenting on the pranayama pranayam and then go into the meditative state induced by pranayama and also like music for instance is it possible that one appreciates music better when the right brain is working more which means the ida is <coughs> being given attention to yes not so much the pingala pingala yes. so here are some openings which we can suggest we can suggest yes ah. uh, uh, i have a, i have a couple of patients uh, they are otherwise suffering from uh, autism and these children they are so perfect in calculating say in 2028 what is the guru purnima day or shivaratri day they will exactly tell in 2 seconds so uh, they are now believed that have an access to what is called as a non local window now non locality is basically defined by science as it doesn't follow the rules of space and time now you have that you you have an access which is all the time there and they have a very limited access to calculations you have an access to non locality fully so that you could write a book uh, the journey continues where you could go back to all the previous journeys so what is the mechanism how do we relate that to the present first time? you see you have this plastic not plastic what did you say artistic artistic artist. artist. now lo yes. look at this now there are these autistic children i know i have i have seen many of these autistic they are imperfect in many ways yes from a yes. point of view yes since they are imperfect in many ways there is some perfection happening in them which normally people don't have uh, which means certain parts of the brain have by nature or by birth been shut off or not acting properly therefore some other part is working what the spiritual practice does is to voluntarily shut it off when necessary so that the other part is working here it is accidental yes that it has so happened they have no control over it we yes. are saying that there is a we can have control over it which is not a, which is not a treatment for autism but that we can at will become autistic <laughs> this will sound funny but <laughs> so, that, <laughs> so that the ordinary brain 
which takes care of or ordinary things that can be made dysfunctional. Right. But which can be restored, but which can be made dysfunctional so right. that something else takes over. And then you can say, when is the next Guru Puna? Not for that. I mean, I'm just giving right. you an extra. Since yes. you, that, the other, now here comes the subject of what are called uh, congenitally, uh, there's there something they're called of uh, children who are born with uh, very um, bad brain handicaps. Cerebral palsy. Ah, Cerebral but palsy. who are very intelligent uh, in one field. Uh, 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 idiot savants. Idi that word is not nice, that idiot. Yes. Okay. That savants. 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 Now the savants are born almost dysfunctional in other ways. They may not talk to people, they don't understand the relationship. But you sit them in a piano, I'm just one example. Yes, sir. And they play beautiful music as if they're like Beethoven. Where does this come from? You see, I think some parts of this brain has been shut off for them. By birth, by accident, whatever you want to call it. So there is something else that is taking over. Now, the, what we need to say, find, is that if that something else is taking over, that something else I am saying is also in all other brains or all other minds, let's keep the brain out for the time being, uh, and that it can be tapped. And to tap it, one should, one should be free of one's conditionings. Right. Uh, but from birth onwards, we are not only, we are born a little bit conditioned, we have more condition is put into us. If these conditionings can be removed, you know, when somebody feels very nice uh, after a drink, is actually what is happening is central nervous system is slightly paralyzed. The inhibition goes. Yes. So then he is moving towards something different and he's enjoying it. It's like wine. Okay. Yes. I'm not saying that everybody should experiment with drinking. <laughs> yeah, but it's just a pointer. I'm also not saying that everybody should be autistic. I mean, these are pointers to show that there are possibilities of opening up layers and layers. So what does what does it mean? What I'm trying to say is that the present knowledge that we have, even of the brain, there may be much more to know. Much more to know, yes. There may be much more to find out. Right. For example, Shakuntala Devi, she had all the time this huh. Ability to calculate. She has never learned mathematics. Yes, but she was not so, a very intelligent person otherwise. That is the funniest thing. Exactly. So <laughs> that, that was one faculty has developed, phenomenon is blown up. So, so that's... Mm -hmm. uh, that's yes, it's a, it's a, so, so the potential is there. That's what I'm trying to say. Yes, the sir. potential is there. In, now, there are two sides to this. If this potential can be scientifically discovered, experimentally. Not that which we are seeking, but the mode towards that. That cannot be put in a test tube. But the mode of looking at it, if that can be made a little more less, a less rigor, uh, rigorous than so-called perfect laboratory science. Yes. Because there are other, many other strands here. It's not just putting in a test tube and checking something. So with the modern gadgets and modern uh, instruments and modern mode of thought available with a great deal of brain research, I'm hoping that in future we may go closer to that, which is the essence that we seek. Yes. It may be the highest level of uh, evolution of the human being. Now we have come to the part of evolution where the frontal lobe is a very important part. I am saying there may be other hidden things in the brain which need to Yes, be. yes, certainly. So there is a huge search for the various nuclei, for example. And, and if only this search can be linked somehow to the ancient science of yoga and Vedanta, I think that will contribute to a great extent. Great extent. Yes. To move forward in this research. Yes. We yes. need to open our minds. To yes, this. to do that, yes. Thank you very much, listeners. 
and Dr. Venkatramana for spending valuable time with us. Thank you very much. Namaskar.